You are winning so much with Kano. I want to come to that. <laughs> okay. I love Kano. Kano is so much fun. You either love that class or you hate that class. Kano is just... It's just a dream, bro. And then I did 73 damage on one turn against him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think that is the dream for every Kano player, right? Kano plays the same 60 cards in pretty much every single matchup. Mm -hmm. And then there's the nine spicy cards that we played this weekend. Uh, I think the most unique one that I actually had a lot of people talking about was I've never seen Michael Hamilton laugh so much, especially when like the deck lists were posted and people were like, what is this? If you like a hero a lot, I think this is the meta specifically for it. Welcome to draw four where I draw four with the best flesh and blood players. Today, my guest is Peter Budensig. He is the embodiment of Kano, the Drakai of Aesir, and will teach you how to live like a wizard yourself. Peter, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you for having me, man. Yeah, it's, it's amazing to talk to you now. <laughs> I have to say, like, the pictures online were crazy. <laughs> Dude, I... I experiencing like that like multiple games like my two stream games on camera and some of that and like all the memes and like the pictures afterwards i was like yeah this is great <laughs> you're a true wizard like nobody can question that <laughs> it's always a fun time playing kano yeah so you ended up in the top eight and mm -hmm. lost your match going into top four but it's a long way to go and i have to say congratulations on your run with kano in the new and fresh meta yeah, thank you. Uh, I I <laughs> unfortunately hit the the worst matchup in top eight, but it was a it was a great run. It was a great run. So in this video, we will draw four topics for you to dive into, mm -hmm. and we will for sure talk about your hero Kano, but also about the tournament and your thoughts on running certain cards in the matchups. My first topic uh, that I want you to dive into is actually yourself. So Peter as the wizard. Yeah, hundred percent. Actually, it was like pretty interesting going to this tournament because I've always so like I primarily test with Majin Bay or Caleb, depending on who you, like when you know him. But it's just like me, mainly me and him for a lot large amounts of, and we've we've tested with people in and out in different tournaments. But going into this weekend, we actually weren't going to be play KO. We were actually going to play like a Katsu or a Fatigue Dash, and we got there on Friday. And I forgot half the cards for Majin <laughs> to play his deck <laughs> because I left them on my desktop, to, like like on my desk. And I was like, oh no. And then we were like scrambling to try to find cards. And then we kind of like were giving up, like having to like order through like the vendors there. And we were like trying to figure out if they had the cards or not. And we like went to go like downstairs of the, of the hotel to like get a drink at the night. And it was like 11, it was about like 11 o'clock. And we have like an hour to submit the deck and we're there and we meet some like other some other like pros came and was like said hi to us and crawford actually was there and he was like asking what we were playing tomorrow and we were like explaining our situation of like not having enough cards <laughs> and he was like wait you guys aren't just playing kano and like we always bring kano no matter what like in our bag just in case like last minute audible and they basically spent like 30 minutes convincing us to play Kano that night. Like after we were like, oh, I don't know if people like people should have AB on like the first tournament where you shouldn't have AB because like they'd be expecting like every wizard player to play it. And, you know, we were known about going to this tournament like beforehand. We were like, ah, let's just play like other decks and like like reassess like later down the line. And they, were, they, they convinced us to play Kano and obviously went very, very well. And obviously we're here now. Yeah, so it was not only a surprise for this tournament, but also I think a very special moment for you going mm -hmm. with Icelander to Living Legend. Now you picking up Kano. Yeah, the, a lot of context is I, I've been playing Kano since like Monarch meta, like mo like when Monarch first came out. So I've played Kano for a very long time, but Majin always convinces me to play Icelander instead, <laughs> which granted is... It so, was a better pick. Explain to those players who are not playing Wizard that much, how is it living as a Kano player in this world? It's definitely a, a fun experience, I'll say that. Uh, Kano is always a blast. Uh, definitely not the most consistent hero, I would say. Uh, you can't really like practice like a singular game plan uh, every single game and like think about that working a lot of the time. Like You really have to process like actually using your life total as like, a mega resource a lot of the time because you don't have armor to block at all, except for like Tunic in some matchups. And so you start at 30 life, and you don't have armor. So the mistakes that you make in the game 
impact the game a lot, a, a lot higher than if if you did have armor, right? Because the armor can bail you out a lot, and or like fix certain mistakes that you make during the game. Like if you overblock in specific areas, and then you can still use your armor to block later. But you, in Kano, you just can't do that, right? So if you make the wrong decision, you always get punished for it. So you are always walking like a tightrope, basically, that how I like to call it. But you do get to interact on both turns of the game, uh, which is quite quite good. Uh, most of the time, I try to not uh, play on my opponent's turn unless it is uh, either free to do, or uh, I'm going to die and need to do it at that moment or I lose the game instantly, or I'm going to win the game uh, knowing the information that's on the table, right? Uh, but playing wizard is extremely hard. <laughs> extremely hard. A lot of decision makings because you can interact at like every single moment and filtering out the bad decisions is the the most complex version of the deck, basically. How can people that were watching you at the Realm Rumble foster this energy themselves? Oh man, I I think like the biggest thing about like the energy at the the Realm Rumble was like I really enjoy playing the game first and foremost. Like I I I really enjoyed everything that Flesh and Blood has pretty much brought to the table, and you know continues to I continue to explore like every time I play the game, and especially playing Kano is just like dude the the amount of like crazy things that can happen in a singular game with with playing Kano is just insane it's always like a fun time to do it and i wish more people could have the amount of fun and the amount of like crazy games that i did this weekend playing kano yeah i hope more people will actually drive towards that because it was a fucking nice thing to watch really it was amazing <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you so tell us like when did you became peter the guy that wants to play a wizard like how did you actually discover kano in the first place Oh, wow. so I started playing Flesh and Blood like a couple weeks before Monarch came out, like during Cru like Crucible, and I started playing the game like just being like a ninja stand. Uh, I really liked how Ninja looked, and I really thought it was like uh, it was like super cool when I first started. And I still think like Katsu, like Katsu and Ira, like made me fall in love with the game basically. And I just thought the whole concept was good. I love Naruto, like the anime, so it was just like the easiest transition of my entire life, right? And so I played a lot of played a lot of ninja at the very start, and I actually met a particular individual that used to play Kano named Alex Four. And Alex Four was obviously pretty known for playing Kano at the very early days, like back in like Monarch and playing on like some webcam games of Blitz, playing Kano. And through that and Arsenal Pass specifically, talking about Kano and Blitz, I always like was very intrigued about it. And then it was in one particular like skirmish season after the first u.s nationals where we weren't like we were just playing skirmish like with like the like the locals and stuff like that and i was like i should just play start playing kano and blitz like i've, I've listened to it a lot and d done a lot of that so uh, i started playing it I, I played a couple games in cc for, here and there at like locals but nothing like too serious but i spent like a week really like trying to figure out like what is the best lines of, like playing blitz kano and then I actually ended up winning the skirmish after spending like an entire week on it. And I basically, after winning that skirmish, I never didn't play Kano and Blitz till it got LL'd. So like two years basically. And then after playing into Blitz for so long, after Pro Tour 1 specifically, I started playing Kano a lot more in CC. I always, when, when Wildfire was announced in Everfest, I thought that card was like insanely bonkers. But back then, I didn't know how to, you know, really evaluate or like, like give it the best potential. Like I, I wouldn't have never thought about Ragamuffin's hat at the time of deck building. And when they showed that, I was like, oh, this is really cool. But I was playing Chain for a long time, and I like practice Kano, like the actual good version of Kano, and then play Chain a lot. And then when Chain LL'd, I was kind of like in a in a weird place of like where what I should be playing. And I just continued to play more Kano at locals and more Kano, and then eventually became like, I was just like, I should just bring this to. I got like talked out of playing Kano in multiple like like nationals and multiple like pro tours, and I was like, hey, you know, I should just, I should just bring it to like a competitive event one time, and then I did really well, and I, now I can't, 
and then Ice Letter came out and we started playing Ice Letter and I was like, I just think Kano is just really, really fun to play and good to play. And then it's just a battle between if me or Majin win of, if, on like convincing each other to play the other wizard because Majin was an Ice Letter stand and I was a Kano stand. Majin usually won, I will say, <laughs> playing Ice Letter. But now that Ice Letter doesn't exist, I now get to sub <laughs> Majin into playing Kano all the time now. <laughs> yeah, that's basically the journey of just playing at a lot of locals and always wanting to bring it to the major event and then getting talked out of it and then playing like the team deck and then now I uh, can't get talked out of it because Kano was good. <laughs> exactly, you showed that at the last weekend for sure. Mm -hmm. So I will share my screen now for the uh, clip from the Pro Tour because I actually okay. want you to tell us about what what this cult surrounding Kano is all about. And I want to start it off with the clip from the Pro Tour because back then, like, le let's see. And um, I mean, you are winning so much with Kano. I want to come to that. <laughs> okay. I love Kano. Kano's so much fun. Uh, yeah, I Kano's just I, that's like one of the classes that are like you either love that class or you hate that class because it's like it's super super hard to play. It's like fundamentally different than every other class in the game. Uh, I think that it's like really important to have characters like that. Like I think Illusionist does that as well, like with Dromai. But no, Kano is just it's just a dream, bro. It's just like every time you're like. Well, I'm going to lose the game, but maybe. <laughs> it's so much fun. I love it. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> that's so true. <laughs> yeah, I I mean, that's out of it. Like, everything I said there is what I still believe in the game. So, yeah, I <laughs> that was a good time. That was a good time. Yeah, I definitely believe that still. So you would still say that Kano for you has a really unique spot, not only in Flesh and Blood, but for yourself. And there are really people like you out there thinking those things about Kano and now having the chance in the new meta without Icelander to tickling it off in a real new way. Yeah, I I definitely believe that like I think you could always play Kano and like a lot of people like showed that but like maybe it wasn't like the best decision a lot of the time. And through like the last year I, I definitely believe that Kano was actually in a really great spot. I played it at multiple battle hardens, played it at a, like a, at US Nationals this year and like a deep run in the calling that was attached to it in day two. And I just I just think right now it's like if you really enjoy playing that style and playing and are really intrigued about playing Kano, like this is this is the time, right? Like without the incentive of like your opponents have having to play like multiple AB because of Icelander and all these other factors like like Runeblade basically doesn't exist in the game anymore in Classic Constructed or like like good ones at least and Icelander doesn't exist so it's like it is y your opponent really wants to ha tech for Kano it, uh, in deck building it, or if Kano is just really good so yeah it's it's pretty nice it's pretty nice this is the time all right, definitely for all the viewers who are watching, like the video to show some love for Kano and Peter. And let's continue with the second topic for you to dive into, which is actually the Realm Rumble itself. The tournament, mm -hmm. let's start with you telling the viewers and myself too, what is the Realm Rumble actually all about? Yeah, so the, the Realm Rumble was actually one of the best events I've probably been to in like all of flesh or blood i'll say like i think what they're doing over at realm is just like incredible and just amazing for the community as well and i'm glad that it is something that is like close enough for me in america to to like go to right i went to one other realm event before this invitational and unfortunately bubbled both 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 events that weekend but no it's just like uh, the realm events always have they're always on time they're always very communicative and listen to feedback a lot he's an amazing guy he really 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 likes the community and really wants to do well for the community and i i really appreciate everything that he does and basically the realm event for this was a, a 20k main event that was invitational i believe there was I don't. I think it was like 115. I don't know the exact number. It was around that that number that were invited to this event, and we all got these really really cool playmats actually that had our names on them, and I thought that was like extremely cool. Like Ultra Pro made them, and it had our, like our names on it with like the Realm like Invitational thing. Like if you saw it on Twitter, it's like really cool, and I, I really appreciated that. And we basically just got to play. Day one was seven rounds of CC, and then day two. 
was three rounds of draft into four rounds of CC into a cut to top eight for day three. And then they did, they streamed every single game of the top eight on day three, yeah. which is like, it was very pro tour vibes. I think every, like basically almost every single person that I played in this in, entire event was a pro tour player, a very known North American player or Canadian. Like it was uh, like, the, I played some insane games this weekend versus some insane players. So yeah, it 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 felt like basically a day two of like a calling or day two of a of a pro tour, and like it was the same people I was playing, the same people I played day two of this realm event was basically the same people I would see at a, a pro tour in day two. Like I played Michael Hamilton, I played Aaron Shantz, I played McInnes, uh, Majin was there, like all like all Matt, Matt W, like all these people that you saw top eight like these major events or always like are just super known names like they were all there i like i played mo all of them like brody last round i played like it it felt like a pro tour basically it was really nice it, it was a great invitational nice i can only say from an outside perspective that i can only underline this and the photos were amazing everything that you could read from it on twitter and see the stream mm -hmm. on youtube so definitely a big shout out to the realm games But tell us more about the new meta after Icelander is now the last hero that went to living legend from the ice era. What were you facing? And you were having also a kind of surprising sideboard, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the matchups I played against, I, I posted like every round that I played against on, on Twitter as well in like a big thread. But I actually like paired round one into Riptide, which was like really interesting. Unfortunately, Riptide is like, Is, is like super bad into Kano but basically I was playing I played like what what you really saw like in the top eight mostly I played a lot of Bolton this weekend I played like three rounds against Bolton I played against Riptide I played a couple of boost dashes I played against like Bravo Azalea and like some of the ninjas like Fi and basically the the, the meta was like what people thought it, it was going to be coming in like a decent amount of Bravo decent amount of ninjas and like Jeremiah and like all the all these like really known decks but what i saw more in this invitational that i've seen before was a lot of deck diversity i think bravo is the most played hero and like followed up by like Fi. i think was like the next one and besides that like you you saw like a lot of like 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 four to like ten represented for like basically almost every hero in the game right like there is like known people like like lucas oswald on like like new prism and like just a lot of people like being like i think this deck is really good right now because like after lexi and ice had it rotated and how like the meta is going and like people were trying out a lot of different heroes that they thought they were good but that were like had really bad matches with ice and you're like there was a lot of bolton that i saw at the top tables this weekend and that you would wouldn't see before because Ice Center was such a bad matchup for it, right? And like now these decks can be more explored and more like well out like I think the especially because of the top eight was seven like seven different heroes with the only with only dash being a multiple was like you could just see how the meta was like completely wide open the entire time. So yeah. It I, I think the direction of this meta is gonna be quite interesting and for the next two months until heavy hitters come out and we'll have to see what Uh, that set also brings to the table. Yeah, for sure. And please, we got a few questions on Twitter already about this. Tell mm -hmm. us about these, maybe at first glance, <laughs> weird cards in your sideboard. <laughs> what are these okay. cards and what are they all about? <laughs> okay, so there's... So I'll talk about the Kato deck specifically first, and then the sideboard mix... A decent amount more sense right so basically what we're going for is that kano plays the same 60 cards in pretty much every single matchup mm -hmm. and then he has eight eight main equipment and then has three cards for dromai which is the one dampen and the two aether darts right the two red aether darts and then the main and dampen is used to kill that my uh, like that my and tumultai specifically and then darts off obviously kill any dragon and that my specifically going through it and You basically you get to run like 33 blues and like and then like the, the regular like yellows and then like finishing out with like swell tidings uh, into the main 60. and then you get to play eight main equipment which is going to be the crucible the waiting moon the tunics the the node the Constellos, cloak hat and then storm shutters is like the main eight equipment so that that brings you into 71 cards 
then there's the nine spicy cards that we played this weekend <laughs> coming through. So I prepared basically like why I would play every single one of these cards in, in the list. The nine cards would be Arcane Lantern, Hardened Crossstrapped, Threadboard Tunic, Imperial War Horn, Oasis, Nourishing Emptiness, Reinforce the Line, Remembrance, and then Brainstorm is like the nine other cards that we brought this weekend specifically for 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 kind of some fun you know so brainstorm specifically uh i will preface this by i will call these nine cards uh majin's trade binder <laughs> because <laughs> we grabbed these nine cards from majin's trade binder uh at 11 30 p.m before our deck list was due in 25 minutes and but there there's like a reason like there's not a real reason to play any of these cards. Uh, I'll, I'll say that uh, Kano only needs to run 71 cards because every other card in Wizard kind of sucks. I'm going to be honest with you. We haven't got support in like 13 months, basically, for Kano specifically. And 13 months ago in, when we got those cards, there were just like reprints of old cards that have like one more line of text, right? And, which is a bad mechanic anyways, so it's like doesn't really matter. So we really only need to play 71 cards because the main 60 is so good. And then the three cards for Jomai is like the only thing you would ever need a sideboard. We decided to have some fun and play some some wacky cards this weekend that you would never see in the Kato list. I would never play these nine cards like actually in like any matchup. I said, I said, actually, I thought about playing Brainstorm like one time versus Fatigue Dash. I think that's the only one you can make like a real assumption. Brainstorm specifically, whenever you draw a card in the action phase, you deal one damage to your opponent. You could technically pitch stack a pitch back into a way to where you could draw all six tomes and then deal 12 arcane damage to your opponent in one turn which would be pretty much the only reason to do that because brainstorm would uniquely get around to oasis for spite that you would think that a a control dash would be playing that was trying to fatigue you so you, that is like a way you could get around it i did not play in control a control dash the entire weekend but i did think about playing it versus them specifically but all the dashes that i played against were boost dash unfortunately but basically the other cards like Remembrance, Reinforce the Line, like Oasis, like Nourishing. I would never, I, I, I wouldn't ever play those cards like in a real game. <laughs> I think you can say you could play Oasis versus like other in like a Kano Mirror. But me and Majin made a pack because we're both playing one Oasis that we wouldn't play it against each other. <laughs> and, <laughs> and then Majin actually played it against the Kano Mirror round one and then didn't play Oasis. And I was like, wait, what? Are I was like, okay, so we're just never playing these cards. <laughs> I, I knew I used to play Nourishing Emptiness specifically for the Dromai matchup. But the more and more like games I play in that matchup, I realized just like having, adding an extra brick to the deck like Eye of Idea and Nourishing. I just don't think it's worth the percentage points that it gives you for having one popper or an additional way because you just already have like basically like six different ways to kill dragons because less than a lava will always tutor so i count those you have like six ways to kill dragons so you don't need a nurturing emptiness specifically because they have to draw a one of three card in their deck but yeah basically and then my favorite cards from this weekend actually were the the equipment that we brought that oh and then there's there's imperial warhorn which uniquely would have been really good against all my dash opponents this weekend but no this this, this is just kind of a meme that if you go first versus jomai technically if you can out and hit it off the top you could kill their gold token and then you could like stop their ash generation or like ha stop them having from a good turn but no no this card's not real either it's just really funny to play uh so you can see like the trend of like us just playing like these random cards that like could be played in the deck but are just like really funny to play <laughs> And then <laughs> uh, Arcane Lantern specifically, it gives you an additional AB1 because you could play it in the mirror and AB5 their uh, wildfire, technically. But why would you ever give up your staff to do that? <laughs> and then like Hardened Crossstrap to pay for our Nourishing Emptiness because how else would I pay for it? And then uh, I think the most unique one that I actually had a lot of people talking about was the Threadboard Tunic. And the more more I actually thought about this card, it was like, it's kind of unique. Funny thing that we made up was that because it has less text than Spellfire Cloak, it helps the mental damage of having to read cards during the event. But realistically, if you have no cards in your hand, you gain a resource. But you can do it on your own turn, yeah. which Spellfire Cloak says that you can, you can only do it on your opponent's turn. So technically, Threadboard Tunic is better, but doesn't have spell like Arcane Barrier One. So I'll leave that to I'll leave that to the people to decide which one would be better. But I would always play Spellfire Cloak. <laughs> but <laughs> 
Yeah. No, they was just like some meme cards basically that were really funny because we were basically like hyping up the secret tech this entire weekend and especially when like the deck lists were posted and people were like what is this it like it was the biggest psyops and let me tell you it was great to watch it on un unfold on twitter and <laughs> unfold i remember i was showing specific people during the like like on like friday saturday and sunday like the 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 cyborg tech basically that we were playing and just like me it like hyping it up saying it was like super super good and it was like revolutionary and like everybody was believing us right <laughs> because like we're like me and Majin are like x1 x2 on kano like after day one and like everybody like we're or like considered like one of the kano like basically the kano guys like in north america and they were like yo if they have these like crazy tech like i wonder what's gonna happen and it's just like nine meme cards we found in his trade binder like 30 minutes before and i showed i remember i showed michael hamilton i played michael hamilton the second to last round of swiss in day two and i won the game because he was playing bravo and kano to bravo is like 90 10 like winning for kano i showed him the tech and he was I've never seen Michael Hamilton laugh so much, man. He was just having, he was like, there's no way you guys did this. <laughs> and like, because like the entire weekend, I hear people talking about like, like coming up to me and be like, dude, what's the tech, man? Like I hear everybody talking about like, you guys have some insane things. And and after showing Kevin, he's like, I can't believe I was, we were wondering, like at dinner, we literally talked about like what, what the tech was like what do you think we thought the tech was and like looking at wizard cards to try to figure it out and it's just like the most random pile <laughs> of cards <laughs> which i will say is probably the funniest thing that i've ever done in flesh and blood is for an entire weekend psyops an entire room and and twitter into thinking that we were playing real cards and we're just playing what we found in modern stray binder <laughs> <laughs> that's absolutely amazing <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would hope I'll say that uh, we are just playing 71 cards and like the other nines are uh, like, uh, we thought we actually had to play 80, you had to like submit a deck list with 80, mm -hmm. but I heard that you only had to submit 80 is like the maximum, so you actually can submit less than 80 cards. In a real event, I would only like basically do 71 cards, but we were having some fun this weekend, so basically, yeah. <laughs> Alright, so for everybody still wondering on that one, I think this is very clear now <laughs> so can you yeah. tell us a little bit more about some of the matchups you were facing at the tournament i played against riptide round one which is pretty good for her kano as well and then i played against a og like boost dash that is i'd say kano's worst matchup in the game because og dash that's specifically playing like the more boost aggressive style does versus kano is that it's one of the unique aggro decks in the format that can naturally play AB3 with only two slots. And realistically, for them, they're always gonna play the boots that have AB1 anyways, because it's like the best thing that they can do. Playing the additional AB2 at their helmet is pretty much free. Like you only have to spend one slot to have a good matchup versus Kano, and why wouldn't you basically for their side? This is one of the decks that can be aggressive, deal a lot of damage and prevent a lot of damage from Kano because they do play like 20 plus blues and they can always pitch to their AB3 and still pressure you on, on their turn. It is one of, it is like Kano's worst matchup in the game, I would say. It's probably like 30, 35% for you to win as Kano. Obviously you can win it. I paired against Boost Dash three times this weekend, one each day and I lost all three. So it's, it, it is definitely a rough one, but yeah, that's how, sometimes you have bad matchups. And then I played against a Bolton and I beat the Bolton. And then that matchup actually, I think, is a lot closer than people would assume if they tech for you specifically. Thankfully, the Boltons this weekend were either playing like AB1 or just the spell fi or the, just the spell void too. But I think moving forward, if Bolton wants to tech for Kano, I'd play like the the Halo, uh, the Halo plus, yeah, yeah. Uh, plus the, the the chess piece if like you charge. It prevents the next one is like Loki really good against mm -hmm. Kano because if I ever want to interact on your turn, charging is an additional cost, so it will always prevent one. And then I think you should play Null Rune Arms and then and then basically any any like token of spellfire, like the one that like spell void ones, like whenever you want to, if you can make additional of those, it's pretty good to play. But no, I still think it's Kano favorite, but that, that one was closer than I expected, I'd say. And then I beat Phi in round four. That matchup is like pretty good for Kano because if they they really can only play b1 and they can't really even pitch into it because they're just like full red line deck basically 
And then I played a Azalea, which is pretty good for Kano as well. And then I played against Trollby, which I believe is like pretty much a coin flip at this point. And just, they don't have a lot of resources depending on what version they're playing. Or if they, like Aaron Chance version, if they have more blues and more yellows. But that was uniquely the game that I played against Fino Black after sitting next to him for five rounds in a row. And then we finally paired against each other. And then I did 73 damage on one turn against him. <laughs> And that, 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 I, I feel bad for him, but I, I had to do it to him, you know? And then the last round of day one, I played against another Bolton. It was Yuki, Lee Bender, who made top eight as well. I played against her and I won that one as well. Then let me try to find my, and then we played three rounds of draft at the event and I drafted Teclo. I was sitting next to Brody. Brody was passing to me and then I was passing to Raj and from my position at the table, I then Raj was passing to Hamilton, who is the stream match, the, the stream drafter. And from my position, uh, it felt like Teclo was very wide open. And from like who was passing to me on the right, like when they were passing to me, it felt like Teclo was wide open. I first picked a red Evo Sentry helmet because I have I, I want to be Teclo when I when I'm drafting anyways. And I do think that the red battle worn is like a very premier first pickable card. So I saw, I saw the head and like my pack was pretty weak besides that. So I took it and then I immediately got past the second red Evo from, from my right and was just like fully in Teclo for the rest of the draft. And it was pretty wide open. There was only three Teclo at the, in the pod. And one of the Teclo on the other side of the draft, who is Matt W picked a lot of the, like, basically picked all the Evos, like all the zero block Evos early. Cause that's what he saw on that side of the table. And in pack three, I saw like three or four like red like like Evo sentries like go past me and like or like I was able to pick them and so me and Raj's decks Raj also was in tech low although I was passing to him but he took a lot of the attacks early and I took a lot of the Evos early and then we kind of like switched in like pack three to where like I took basically exclusively like premier red attacks and he took premierly the the Evos that I already had extras of and he took them and our decks were quite good and then yeah so i 2 won to my draft after i lose i lost a very close teclo mirror to matt w in round two so that basically came to like i have like one card of one card but he attacks first so i have to block with my card and so i eventually die and it was a really close one and then i played against aaron chance the first round of day two in cc on camera and it was one of the most insane games I, I, I probably played of Kano either. So I, I beat his Dromai. And then I lost to Matt W on OG Dash, which was a pretty interesting game as well. And then I beat Michael Hamilton on Bravo, playing there, and secured my top my top eight. And then I played against Brody in the very last round. And he was playing Azalea. And we were kind of memeing through our game, and I ended up throwing the game at one point. I, I kind of looked back, and I was like, if I would have won that game, I would have had a, like, a better seating to top 8. But like top 8 pairings are just like all random, basically, because I don't know like standings going into like the very last round. Uh, although we knew we were like locked, we didn't know where everybody else was. I lost that one, and then got paired into Boostash in the quarters, and obviously I lost to the Boostash in the quarters as well. So yeah. All right, so is there anything else that you want to give away for the viewers from the event? I'll just say, like, uh, th the most I'll say about it is that if you like a hero a lot, I think this is the meta specifically for it. If you've put a lot of hours into any hero, basically, in the meta, you can find success right now. And I think Flesh of Blood is trending towards that as well. We don't, I don't really think there is a lot of decks specifically that are, like, way better than every other deck in the format. So I think you can basically play whatever you want besides like very few things and find success with it and i think i've I, like i've basically been playing kano for like three years and like sometimes you play something for three years and then it finally becomes good and then now you have like 2000 plus games on a character and you're just going to be that guy so it's really cool it's really cool to see all right so i hope this gives this gives a, a lot of motivation for the players out there running their favorite hero into the next tournaments for those that want to learn how to play Kano and how to build them, let's actually cover this topic in a little bit. So you said an example here where you had a turn where you dealt 73 damage. 
yeah. <laughs> I yeah. think that is the dream for every Kenner player, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was quite, it, it was quite funny. <laughs> it's quite good, quite good, I'll say. So, how can new players learn how to do those things with Kano? Yeah, basically, I'll say that like the natural thing that you should do as Kano is there's a couple ways of playing different matchups, but the most likely one that you do is playing towards you know the wildfire blazing combo at the end of the game. For example, of how to do that is that you have wildfire blazing aether in your arsenal, and then you have like an amount of resources in your hand. And then you have Ragamuffin's hat to put the either the Blazing or the Wildfire on top of your deck and then switch it out for a resource card after you Kano to exile the top card of your library. And basically you want to use Wildfire and any spell in the middle and then Wildfire at the end to be able to do upwards of like 22 to like 36 damage or like you can go up past 40 as well but usually it's around 22 to 36 damage if you pump the Wildfire up to 6 and depending on how much they arcane barrier the wildfire or any of the other spells on the chain right something uniquely to kano is that he has a spell that does amplifying damage in wildfire and it does exponential damage because you know, how many spells that you play on that chain specifically can it can do even more damage and then blazing aether always reads for the amount of damage you've already done it does that much damage as well and then also gets pumped by the wildfire post doing that so you can do some insane turns so if you come in through with wildfire for six from your arsenal using your storm shatters to cast it from your arsenal and then you do any spell let's just say it's a lesson in lava and then you tutor the blazing and then put blazing on top and then kano the blazing with the last three resources you have to come with blazing that is going to be like your normal basically like run in the middle combo is just wildfire any middle spell into blazing some other unique ones that you can do that I'll say that are some of my favorite is that you play, you drop your hand, you have wildfire and arsenal, and you drop your four card hand, and you look at it like triple blue and a, a a red spindle, for example, and you can wildfire and then put red spindle on top and then play the red spindle, and with the last Kano activation floating, basically, that you can like opt like seven to like twelve cards. And try to set up a either to find the blazing aether in your deck or find like multiple tomes into like other additional spells into like a blaze like another spell into blazing is something that you can set up which is really 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 fun to do because i hit multiple times this weekend uh, i killed people with the the wildfire into spindle into looking at like 10 cards in my library and then uh finding a blazing or uh, like a spell that kills them from there so uh, that's one of the more fun combos. Uh, specifically, if I want to talk about the the game I played versus Fino, uh, how I killed him was I played a wildfire into a sonic boom, and my sonic boom hit a second sonic boom, and then my the second sonic boom hit another hit another spell, and that, and then I played uh, blazing, which so I shot like five spells at him and then a blazing so it was uh, a lot a lot of damage but usually it's a it's a three spell combo but if you ever get into a four to five spell combo it is absolutely disgusting amount of damage all right so if any of the viewers have in more in-depth questions about kano drop them in the comments below but for sure one question that i got was the eye of ophidia in Kano. So can you talk a little bit about Eye of Ophidia and if it is really necessary to run the deck? I will say that it's not... I will say that I will always run Eye of Ophidia in your deck, in my Kano deck. Do I think that you need to? No. I'll say that in your bad matchups, Eye of Ophidia gives you percentage points to win the game more likely. And even in your good matchups, like securing the game specifically is how you can win. But innately, if, when you're adding Eye of Ophidia into your deck, you're adding a whiff card. You're adding a card that if you activate Kano, if it's on top, you do just can't do anything, basically, or have to do very specific things. But the amount of games that, have, that Eye of Ophidia has won me is a lot. The amount of games that Eye of Ophidia has lost me in the game specifically is, you know, a decent amount, but it's not as bad. If you ever get to... Basically, any Kano player will tell you if you act if you get to pitch with Ivyphidia and opt two, your chances of 
like winning the game or doing more damage or winning the game from that position goes up like 10 20 percent just because the dish the more information that you have as kano the more information you have is so much better for you than your opponent like if just allows you to look at additional two cards and make correct decisions every time and i'll say that is worth a lot to me and i would always play ivafidia even though it can lose you the game sometimes all right so then let's close out this topic with learning a little bit about kano and actually talk about the future with kano and this position and the upcoming meta because people were wondering can kano ever be s tier in your opinion <laughs> i mean it, it it can like obviously i think any deck could be one of the like the best decks in the format like being the like the best deck in the format or like one of the top three would be insane to me to think about. I would say that if Kano, Kano would need more cards and more playable cards for him to ever reach that status. I will always think that he's like basically like the borderline of S tier, more like an A, like an A tier hero when he is good. Like specifically in this meta, I think there is decks that are more consistent and have better matchup spread than he does currently. But I do think he is like an ET hero current, like right now. For him to be an S tier hero, he would have to. Uh, we would have to get a another like Kano specific wizard card, hopefully in heavy hitters. But as Brian Cotley tweeted at me on Twitter saying that we won't get Kano support for another year because I top aided an event, and I was quite sad. But I think he's joking, cut over said. But hopefully we like if Kano got another specialization that was better than specific cards in your deck, then I could see him getting even better. I could see if he got uh, a qu wizard equipment that could block and also do relatively same effects that happen right now. I could see him being really good. And I could also see, I know uh, James was talking about a full arcane set coming out in the future. Obviously, we don't know any timetable of when that would happen. But if you could rebuild a wizard into doing like multiple different things, um, that would be the set. And I could see him getting enough cards in that set specifically or to either rebuild him entirely to have another function or make the pre-existing combo deck that he is even more consistent and viable to play. That's what I would say. I do think he is A tier currently, but he is extremely hard to play and will probably never be more than like 5% of a metagame ever. But usually if you ever see a Kano on day two of, a, of an event on like the top tables, just know those are probably one of the best Kanos in the world that are playing, and I, I feel bad if you pair against them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, so I think this is enough of a look in the future for Kano, but here at the end of the video, after we have drawn our four topics, is there a bonus tip that you want to give away? Don't play in your opponent's turn unless you have to. Play in your turn.